All right, off to reading comprehension. So this is pretty much the only hour of reading comprehension we're gonna do toward the end of the broadcast, hour number 23. I'll do kind of half reading comp and half critical reasoning toward the end. Um, reason why I wanna start with reading comprehension is almost to make this point that people tend to ignore it more than they could. But reading comprehension, think of it as the tent pole of your GMAT score. So it's one of the things that is the least satisfying to study because what does it mean? You're taking fairly basic techniques, you're applying them, that's it. You don't feel like you're learning anything necessarily uh, because the techniques are so kind of fundamental. What are we getting at here? It's okay, read it, understand it, think about the main idea, pay attention, use process elimination. That's about it. I'll walk through all that in more detail in just a moment. Um, but it is not sexy. People ignore it. So I wanted to lead off with that for the first hour. Um, I'm going to give you pretty challenging passages here. Um, and so you might suffer a little bit. That's great. Suffer with me. I'm going to be suffering a ton too as the day goes on. I'll make tons of mistakes. Make the mistakes with me. And let's try to enjoy it as best we can. Okay, real quick. Um, I've done reading comprehension videos on the YouTube channel, on the GMAT Club YouTube channel before. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that in massive, massive detail because it's the super compressed version. We have four or five hours of it already up on the, the GMAT Club channel. Basically, what I want you to do, don't try to swallow the passage whole. I want you to take it one paragraph at a time or one chunk at a time. And I want you to think about the author's purpose. I want you to think about the author's point of view. That's the really important part here. So as you go through, stop, digest, and say, what does the author really want from me? Fight for the author's purpose. Sometimes it's not obvious. I'm actually going to deliberately give you some passages where it isn't, but I want you to fight to say, what does the author want from me? What other people are in the passage trying to make statements? Is there some expert there or something? Can you focus on those, figure out whose point of view is which, and make sure you're really fighting for not just the purpose, but how these different paragraphs connect? How do these purposes, of the, the, let's say two, two paragraphs in a passage, how do those purposes link up with each other? Spend the time, invest that time. You're not going to get anywhere by rushing through. Most common mistake we see is people try to skim. They try to hurry through. They don't take the time to digest. So I'm going to give you a pretty tough passage right out of the gate here. Two paragraphs. I'm going to show you the first paragraph first. Then we're going to come back and discuss it briefly. Give you the second paragraph. Then we'll work through the questions. All right. Everybody ready? Let's do this. And we'll give you a couple minutes to digest this. And what I want you to think about is what's the author really getting at here? Is there a purpose? And if so, can you summarize it pretty briefly? All right, let's come on back. I'll leave it up on the screen in case anybody's still reading. Um, and I apologize for any names I slaughter. And a hit, I think you've pretty much nailed it there. I really like it. Part of why I picked this passage, number one, it's tough when you get to the questions. Um, typically what we've been seeing on GMAT Club is maybe half to two thirds are getting them right on this passage. So it's a tough one, very deliberate on our part. Um, that's part of it. The other part of it is, so the, the kind of textbook thing that we tend to say is, okay, stop in the paragraph, fight to find the author's purpose. And sometimes it's really not clear. Now, mistakes I'm already seeing out of the live chat, things we see all the time with our students, things we see on the forum, sometimes you start putting in your own ideas. So I'm seeing kind of these um, this idea that, oh, Locke hates capitalism or the author hates capitalism or something like that. Um, I'm not saying that's wrong necessarily, but it's not helpful. You need to be literal, literal, literal. I always talk about how reading comprehension is not remotely sexy. Be literal. Don't get outside the box. Don't start putting in your own opinions or what you already know about economics or labor theory value or whatever else. Take what you're given. What do you think is going on here? I don't think the author's point of view is very clear here at all. If I were to say what the purpose is, I think I had kind of nailed it here. And again, apologies for any mispronunciations of names. That really, this is kind of an introduction. So it's kind of the introduction of labor theory value. I think that's fair. And it kind of traces Locke's origins a little bit in thinking of it. So, so where did that come from? So it's kind of the foundations of ideology. And one, you know, maybe fairly small thing here is that uh, Locke said that as much as 99% of the value came from labor of any useful good. Labor theory value came, made it to, made it 100% later, but you know, fair enough. So labor theory value says that 100% of value is labor. And Locke said 99%. Okay. Really two, say two or three broad things that can go wrong here. One of the things we talk about all the time on reading comprehension, your goal is not to overread and it's not to underread. And that is a really, really fine line to walk. Mistake number one, I typically see on a passage 
is you just kind of skim through it and just kind of get a surface level understanding. You're not digging for purpose. And again, I'm being a little mean here. I gave you a paragraph to start with that doesn't clearly have an author's point of view. Did that on purpose. But you can kind of skim through it and just kind of go, I don't know, something about labor and, and move on because you're feeling that time pressure. Put the clock out of your head. Make sure you understand that paragraph. I know it sounds really dumb, but we see this mistake all the time. It is one of the most common things we see out of our students. Very common thing we see on the forum. The opposite side of that coin, you overread, you obsess over every little word, every little detail. That's not going to help you either. Make sure you're engaging the big picture as much as you can. Third here on this particular one, you don't want to hallucinate a purpose or a main idea that isn't there, which is why I thought that some of the answers I'm seeing here where it's just kind of saying, yeah, it's introducing something, but just be a little careful. There's a little distinction here. Here's Locke, kind of the predecessor of this idea, of this theory, said 99% of the value of any useful good comes from labor. And that kind of later turned into something that was 100%. All right, that's interesting. And that's good enough for now. Let's keep moving. Next paragraph. So same thing here, what I'd like you to do, Focus on that second paragraph. I'll give you a couple minutes. Um, as soon as you think you know what the kind of the primary purpose of that paragraph is, go ahead and, and toss it in the chat, please, if you're watching us live. Just as importantly, I want you to think about how do these things connect? So how does kind of what you saw in paragraph one and what you saw in paragraph two, how do those thing, two things connect? We're going for really active reading here. All right, I'll leave it up there uh, for anybody who's still working at it. I'm seeing some really good stuff here. Um, and, and definitely seeing some good stuff from some folks I know, which makes me happy. Um, here's the thing that I, I think is getting lost as I look at some of these comments. Um, notice that there's kind of a, it's not, not exactly two different theories. I wouldn't necessarily say that. But there's the labor, labor theory of value, which is kind of the theory that people ran with, that originated with Locke, right? So Locke is the intellectual forebear. So look at the first paragraph. Locke is the intellectual forebear of that labor theory of value. What's the second paragraph getting into here? Yeah, it's kind of saying, I'm getting a lot of stuff that I think is a little oversimplified that I'm seeing in the chat. It's not just that the author disagrees. It's really, that feels right. Author disagrees with theory. Is that really it? And this is the kind of thing I want you to fight for, right? So that's a really good start. The author disagrees with the theory, you bet, and has some evidence for it, right? And says, among other things, that so one third, of value is capital in a modern economy. And, and the author goes on to say that some of that accrues to workers through pensions and whatever else. But I, I don't think this is the author's point. I don't think the author's just saying this theory is wrong. Look at that last sentence. And some of you very nicely identified that that's kind of the heart of it. The labor theory of value systematically disregards the productive um, contribution of capital goods. Okay, we're very clear about that throughout the paragraph. But then at the very end, the author ties it back to Locke. That's the key. So the author is basically saying, author disagrees with, with the theory, basically says that, that that theory, that failing is wrong. But that Locke, what's the exact phrasing there? Locke must bear part of the blame. And this is where we get to the heart of what the author wants from you, right? The author's trying to pin this on Locke. The author's not just criticizing a theory in general, not just criticizing labor theory of value. The author's saying, look, Locke was the forebear of that theory. That theory is very clearly wrong based on what we see in modern society. Therefore, we've got to look at Locke, who kind of originated a precursor to the theory, and blame him as well. All right. Everybody having fun? I can't hear you, so don't answer that. Let's go ahead and on to a question. Um, question number one here, have at it. I'll give you guys a couple minutes. And again, I see 400 and something people watching us live, makes me happy. I'd love to see 400 responses to this question in the chat. Um, I won't be able to make any sense of it, but that'll make me happy, put a smile on my face. I'm gonna allow you guys to keep my energy up all day. So please, please, please put your responses in. Nobody's gonna judge you. Okay, this is this is great. Seeing some disagreement makes me happy. It means we picked a good hard question. Again, I'm not giving you softballs today, kind of throughout. There's going to be a couple moments where I'll give you kind of a little test on foundation, especially in quant. Then we're going to move on to some of the harder stuff where I see the pitfalls. Um, all right. So one very, very small piece of hygiene. So as I was saying at the beginning, 
you know, I would love to give you some magic complicated thing on reading comprehension. Hey, go, go draw, go draw a spider and the eight legs all mean different things. And it's going to magically solve your reading comp problems. Sorry, guys, there's just nothing like that that really helps that much. I just want you to focus on don't, don't read too fast. Don't read too slow. Make sure you're reading for purpose, point of view, trying to connect ideas. That takes time. That takes calibration to do right. That's the heart of your reading comprehension. The one little piece of kind of, let's call it technique hygiene sort of thing. Cross-elimination always. So one of the easiest things to do kind of at the question level, so beyond the passage, but as you get into the questions, is you fall in love. So I could very, very easily fall in love with A here. So author of the passage is primarily concerned with criticizing Locke's economic theories. Author criticizes Locke, no doubt about it, right? Locke must bear part, must bear part of the blame. But is that really what the author's going after? It's not about Locke's theories in general. The author's targeting the labor theory of value and saying Locke contributed to it in a very direct way, because he was the forebearer of it, saying 99% of useful productive value comes from labor. So the author's picking on a theory, not theories, not criticizing Locke in general. This is much more about the theory of value, yes, Locke's role in it, but it's kind of those things in tandem. That's why it's not A. Author's not really criticizing both. Now, very, very easy to fall in love with A and go, yep, author's criticizing. You're under time pressure on the test. A lot of you would just go, yep, that's A peace out, not even pay much attention to B, C, D, and E. Maybe you read them kind of too quickly or whatever. Um, don't do that. I want you to find your four wrong answers, not one right answer. I'm going to say that over and over through the day on all the verbal questions. Find four wrong answers, not one right answer. Um, now, if you're not so sure on A, I would have no problem on your first pass if you said, yo, I'm going to hang on to this. Um, because, well, yeah, I mean, the author's criticizing law. Maybe, maybe there's something better. Maybe there isn't. I'm great with that. What I don't want you to do is say, yep, it's criticism and go. You got to digest all five answer choices. And I know a lot of you are thinking, yeah, I don't have the time for that. You got to make the time. It's not worth spending the time on the question unless you're going to maximize your odds of getting it right. This is something you, unfortunately, you just have to do, especially if you're shooting for that elite score. All right. So I'm going to keep A in for now so we can argue about it later because I'm seeing a lot of people pick A. B, discounting the contribution of labor in a modern economy. Author by no means does that. Author acknowledges that at least two thirds of value comes from labor. And then also kind of says of that third that accrues to capital, workers get a bit of it. It, it isn't minimizing the contribution of labor by any means. Uh, C, questioning the validity of the labor theory of value. This seems a lot closer to me, right? Because the author is saying, no, 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 the, the theory doesn't work. Yeah, it's partly Locke's fault. And that's a big part of what the author is saying. But we've got a really, really strong kind of overall questioning of how valid this theory is. It's really kind of all it's getting at. First paragraph introduces the theory. Second paragraph says, yeah, this, this no, this, this doesn't work. Capital is useful. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about Locke in there, but that's part of the question of the validity, right? Is saying that Locke kind of had this wrong all along and it evolved into something that was a little more extreme than Locke. So it's partly his fault. But the author is really kind of about to question that validity. So I'm keeping C. Notice that I'm not circling C. And again, if you have your own kind of way of kind of making little notations, that's fine. One thing I really don't like really on anything on verbal, people will kind of do, oh, there's a question mark, there's a smiley face, there's a heart. I, I don't know. You're just biasing yourself. What I always want you to do is once you know that it's wrong, cross it out. If you're not sure, keep it in. Simple. So again, on my first pass, I kept A in. I, don't, I didn't think it was right, but until I'm sure that it's wrong, I'm not going to ditch it. C, I'm going to keep that one in as well. That seems to really kind of cut to the heart of what the, the author's doing. Uh, D, arguing for a more equitable distribution of business profits. That's way off. That, that doesn't come in here at all. E, contending that employers are overcompensated for capital goods. That doesn't happen either here. So there, there's really no argument about kind of the broader implications of equity or anything like that. So we can get rid of E. Now, again, I think I already spoiled the surprise here between A and C. Um, I think C is much, much stronger. This isn't a general critique of Locke's theories in general. This is a critique of the labor theory of value. Yes, a critique of the predecessor of it or the guy that originated its predecessor. But the author is not really getting an overall critique here of, of Locke. It's a critique of this particular theory and Locke's role in it. So our answer is C. All right. Uh, let's give you another question. I'm saying a really... Sorry to interrupt uh, your, your work on question to you guys. I'm actually seeing a really cool conversation in here. Um, let me come back here for a second. It's a really cool, cool conversation in here about kind of the, um, some of the nuances of wording. 
Um, and I don't necessarily want to split hairs over. I want to get on to the next move question. So I'm not going to spend time kind of splitting hairs over question number one again. But one thing I want you guys to keep in your, probably the fronts of your heads always with reading comprehension, critical reasoning, sense correction, in general and verbal, you're not looking for a bulletproof answer. Very rarely. There are times when your answer is going to be bulletproof. You're looking for the best of them. So you might look at this and go, well, questioning the validity of the labor theory of value, which was the correct answer on that, that last one. I go, oh, question, is, is the author questioning or criticizing? And it's like, well, let's not split those hairs too much. You're not looking for perfection. You're looking for the best of the bunch. I would make a very strong argument that C is undoubtedly better than A. All right. Back to question two. I'll shut my mouth for 30 seconds. All right, not bad, you guys. It's, it's some pretty good answers here. It makes me happy. According to the author of the passage, which of the following is true of the distribution of the income derived from the total output of consumer goods in a modern economy? That's a mouthful. Um, all right, let's look at A. Workers receive a share of this income that is significantly smaller than the value of their labor as a contribution to total output. Um, now, the author is certainly not saying that, that workers don't receive enough. Um, we, can, we can debate whether the author seems to have a point of view on, on whether they, whether it's fair, right? I, I don't think the author really does there. The author says labor receives two thirds plus via pension, savings, whatever, investments. They get a share of that other third. Um, but there's no argument that workers are receiving too little or that it's a smaller share than their actual values. We can get rid of A. B, owners of capital goods receive a share of this income that's significantly greater than the contribution total output attributable to these capital goods. Another mouthful. But look, again, the author's not really opining on how much value there actually is. The author's kind of saying in that last paragraph, like, yeah, here, here's how it works. Like two thirds of it goes to labor and one third goes to capital with some of that addition going to labor. Not really saying, well, hey, here's the, here's the amount they deserve or that would be fair or that the actual productivity is worth versus what they receive. He or she is not getting into that at all. We can get rid of B. Um, I'll be honest with you guys. I remember the first time I saw answer choice C, I, I didn't, I, I, I don't think I crossed it out, but I didn't like it. <laughs> and I think everybody has that reaction sometimes. We look at an answer choice and go, I don't like this. I'm uncomfortable with it. Uh, owners of capital goods receive a share of this income that is no greater than the proportion of total output attributable to the use of capital goods. Yeah, that's not bad, right? Because the, the author is saying that the owners of capital goods aren't receiving an excess amount, right? The author is saying that a third of the total output of consumer goods is attributable to the use of capital goods. So capital accounts for one third of the value of consumer goods. Now, how much, according to the passage, are the owners of capital goods receiving? Uh, a third, but only sort of, right? The workers get a piece of that too. So that phrasing in C is super, super, super careful where it says owners of capital goods receive a share of this income that is no greater, right? So it's equal to or less than. Yeah, fair enough. That's exactly what the passage is saying too, right? Is that a third of the value comes from capital goods. The owners of those capital goods actually receive a third or less, depending on how you want to think about it. Great. We'll hang on to C. D, owners of capital goods are not fully compensated for their investment because they pay out most of the share of this income to workers as wages and benefits. Nothing about that. The author is certainly not making the case that the owners of the capital goods somehow are entitled to or have produced 100% of the value and end up giving two thirds of it away. That is definitely not what the author is going after there. And E, workers receive a share of this income that is greater than the value of their labor. I'm going to stop there for a second. I saw a decent number of people picking E. That first piece, not bad, right? Workers receive a share of this income that is greater than the value of their labor. Okay. Because the author is kind of arguing that, yeah, two thirds in a modern economy, two thirds of the value of the goods comes from labor. Workers receive that. Cool. They also receive a little bit more, right? In the form of kind of the pensions and the shareholders, right? So we're good so far, but you got to keep reading. Because the labor theory of value overestimates their contribution to total output, that is not why they receive too much. That it has nothing to do with it at all. The author's not even arguing that it's too much exactly. But it has nothing to, how much they receive has nothing to do with what the labor theory of value is estimating or not estimating. So for that reason, he is out. Getting questions about the difficulty here. Um, 
and please, people are watching live, please, please remind me as we, as we go through. Um, I can't always tell you with great precision how, you know, what level of a question it is, especially as we get to some of the quant, I'll be doing unofficial questions, but I can give you a sense of how important I think it is to nail this. Um, this particular question, I, I want to say that um, if people who've done the timers on GMAT Club, maybe two thirds correct. Um, most of the questions I'm going to pick on in, in this hour, um, half to two thirds correct, giving you a pretty hard reading comp. So if your goal is something like a 40 or above on verbal, yeah, you need to be getting this. If you're somebody who's going to be content with the score that's a little bit lower than that, you're probably all right. This should be a struggle. Again, even if you're you're kind of going for that high score, you're doing pretty well, you're scoring around a 40. I wouldn't be shocked if you struggle a little bit here on this on this particular passage. So um, so yeah, these are these are pretty tough. Um, all right, let's do one more. And then the next question or the next passage, we'll do one more question on this passage. Um, and then I'm going to try to blow you guys away with a, a short passage that I think is super, super, super nasty. And we might not get very far into it, but uh, we'll at least try to break it down a little bit. All right. Last question from our guy, Mr. Locke. Okay. I guess I picked one that was uh, <laughs> maybe too easy this time, which is good. Um, so as some of you were suffering through the first two questions, I'm not seeing any disagreement on this one. And maybe the rest of you just being shy. Which of the following best describes the organization? Again, look, it, I, I know it becomes kind of trite and everyone gets tired of hearing it after a while, but cross elimination, take what they give you. You're not necessarily going to find a perfect answer. If I try to imagine what the organization, the passage is, I may well lead myself off in a, in a funny direction. Uh, so let's take this one at a time. The author explores the origins of a theory. Cool and explains why the theory has never gained widespread acceptance. That definitely doesn't happen. Um, if anything, the author is kind of criticizing that people seem to believe in it. B, the author introduces the premise of a theory, mm, evaluates the premise by relating it to objective reality, then proposes the modification of the theory. No modification of the theory going on here. B's out. C, after quoting a well-known authority, not really sure the author's thinking to lock this in authority. I guess it's not much of a quote. You, you kind of have the terms, the effects of labor, labor theory value, shaky there already. The author describes the evolution of a theory, then traces its modern form back to the original quotation. Now, look, this is not anchored in the quotation. That is not what the author is doing at all. Anchoring it in Locke's ideas, not in a particular quotation. Don't be fooled just because there's quotation marks. D, after setting a precursor to the theory, that's Locke's ideas. The author outlines and refutes the theory. Exactly what we talked about in that first paragraph. We really have two theories there. And that's where that close reading and that willingness to kind of take a breath, spend the extra 15 seconds going, okay, I'm not sure I see the author's point of view, but I can see that there's kind of two different things going on. There's Locke's theory, and then there's kind of the newer version of it, 99% versus 100%. So yeah, the author's outlining, so setting the precursor of a theory, that's Locke, outlining and refuting the theory, and then links it to the predecessor again. Yeah, you bet. This is spot on. Can't get much better than that. Um, I'm getting a little bit of... Um, objection to E or, or people who picked E. After tracing the roots of a theory, the author attempts to undermine the theory by discrediting the originator. Let's think about how exactly the author is discrediting the theory um, or is undermining the theory. It's not by discrediting the originator. Yes, the author is critical of Locke and says that this theory is wrong, but it's just a whole bunch of evidence there saying, here's how it works in a modern economy. Two thirds goes to labor, one third goes to capital. That's the way the author is going about undermining the theory, not by discrediting Locke and saying, well, Locke, Locke didn't know anything. Locke never went to school. Locke was just a GMAT tutor. He knew nothing about economics. Not what the author's saying at all. Authors refuting it by saying, no, here's the nuts and bolts of why empirically, why this is wrong. It's not really an attack or a discrediting at all of the originator. So E is out. E is our winner. Okay. Um, we have, I know we started a little bit late here. So um, I think on the next passage, we'll, we'll probably end a little bit past uh, the hour here. I'm going to give you a different passage. This one's pretty nasty. It is one of those single paragraph uh, passages. I think those can be super, super, super intimidating. Uh, so I'm going to have you guys tackle that. Now, here's the thing. So when I think about sort of the, you know, if you watch kind of my older videos, you know, I talk about, okay, break, you know, uh, stop it at the end of every paragraph. I'm going to think about what's going on, take a breath. Stop, what's the author's purpose? When you get these big blobs, when you have just a block of text, it's a single paragraph, that's when a lot of you get intimidated. So one of the biggest things I see people doing wrong, who are really, really good readers, is they look at a wall of text, they look at a long paragraph, 
or for that matter, a long passage, and their technique falls apart, or they see a, a topic that they don't like or they're uncomfortable with, oh, it's science, and they lock up. Look, None of these are meant to have any, so your performance or reading comprehension has nothing to do with any knowledge you have beforehand. If anything, I think it can hurt you. So empirically, as we look at our students and we kind of, you know, we see a student who maybe has sort of a technique issue where their approach isn't perfect. Sometimes we see them struggling more on passages that are in their wheelhouse. So for example, this was economics. Um, I've seen a lot of people with economics backgrounds really struggle on it because when they read the passage, they go, oh, wait, wait, yeah, yeah. I studied Locke in my freshman year of college and I know all this stuff about Locke and labor theory. and so when you know about the topic, sometimes it can lead you astray just as much as when you don't. My point is <clears throat> the topic has nothing to do with what the task is. GMAT's trying to be really, really fair about saying no no previous knowledge is, is valuable um, or even helpful at all. So just follow your process. Read, don't get intimidated. Stop every once in a while. So as you get look at these long paragraphs, stop every once in a while and go, what's the author getting at? Where's their point of view? Does the author have a point? Is there a purpose here? Keep fighting for that purpose. And if you need to break the thing up in a couple of different sections, go for it. You don't want to get to the end and realize that you're screwed. So stop if you need to every few sentences and go, do I know what's going on? All right. Enough babble. Let's have some physics. Um, oops. Didn't mean to break this whole thing up. All right. Well, that's fine. I'm actually going to give you the whole thing all at once. Um, give you guys a few minutes. This was actually not, this was actually written as a single big paragraph. And I think it got chopped up when we did the slides. So I've actually made this task a whole lot easier for you guys by accident. Um, but that's all right. So when you guys see this in some other context, you'll know what to do with it. So let's roll with this. And uh, yeah, we'll maybe do one question real quick before we end the hour up. All right, you guys are nailing this. Makes me happy. So the author of the passage mentions calculations about tunneling time and barrier thickness in order to do what? A, suggests that tunneling time is unrelated to barrier thickness. Exactly the opposite, right? So there is definitely a relationship between barrier thickness and tunneling time. That's actually where it gets interesting. That's how you get to this speed of light thing or past the speed of light thing. A is out. B, explain the evidence by which Winger and Eisenbud, great names, discover the phenomenon of tunneling. That's not quite it either. The, the idea of tunneling had been hypothesized before. The thickness isn't how they discovered it exactly. C, described data recently challenged by Raymond Chow and colleagues. Definitely not that, right? So um, Wigner and Eisenberg's theory was actually supported by the data that Chow and his colleagues came up with. So it is, it is not C. D, explain or question why particles engage in quantum tunneling rarely achieve extremely high speeds. It actually kind of says in the very beginning that it's not going to happen very often, right? But that it's theoretically possible. And that's where it's interesting. So we're not questioning why it happens exactly. Um, it's actually really kind of about explaining how that works, right? How those calculations sort of lead to this idea. There's a maximum on the time. Therefore, at some point, you're going to get super fast tunneling. And that is exactly Wigner and Eisenbutt's hypothesis. The tunneling hypothesis tunneling particles sometimes move faster than the, the speed of light. Why? Well, yeah, it's because there's a maximum on the tunneling speed, or sorry, maximum on the tunneling um, time, which means that as barrier thickness increases, you could get super luminal speeds. That's why we've got E and not D. All right. We are already running a little bit late here. So we're going to wrap this one up. Um, bottom line on reading comp. Again, we're going to come back a little bit of reading comp in hour number 23. Um, so we're going to challenge all of us, myself included, with some of the hardest reading comp and critical reasoning passages I could find. So official stuff, super, super hard. One last real quick thing about reading comprehension before we put it to bed for the next 22 hours or so. Um, getting some questions about, about materials. I am a huge, 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 huge fan of using the LSAT. If you know you're going to be studying for the GMAT for the long haul, pick up some LSAT books. Um, the correlation between LSAT performance on reading comp and GMAT performance is super, super strong. I say that just kind of working with student after student after student. We can usually predict the verbal scores pretty well off of how they're doing on the LSATs. Now, the LSATs are harder. They're going to make your eyes bleed. They're super tough. You start doing LSATs, you switch over to the GMAT. The GMAT's going to feel a lot easier. It's really good for you. Um, so highly, highly recommended doing that. All right. Thank you, everybody.